I am um, the Joint Managing Director of the Southwark News, which is the only independent paid-for title in London, and we have two other titles. It's a week, that's a weekly paid-for for this area. And then we have uh, a Lambeth fortnightly free sheet and a, a Southwark monthly sheet called Southwark Weekender, Lambeth Weekender. Anyway, when I was looking back and saying, how do you boil down for something to be inspirational? And I kind of started thinking really about the, the people in my life, the, uh, the key people in my life that might have been inspirational, your parents and such. And then I, I really boiled it down to three men. And I think, you know, it, it really made me think, because there were really just three men in, in my life. And now that then helped me start off as, you know, a young guy on a Birmingham council estate to doing the average thing, going to university, going off to America, doing an internship, becoming a, a journalist at a local paper, within a year then becoming the editor of a local paper, and within a few years, the actual joint owner of that newspaper. And I, I was 26 at that age. I was 22 when I uh, was the editor of the local paper, and I was 26 when I became one of the owners of the local paper. And as you guys know, local papers are owned by big, massive new, new media groups. Um, we are truly independent, us and the Camden New Journal. And as years have gone by, I've really appreciated that more and more in a, in a world dominated by multinationals. But where all I wanted to be was a journalist. I didn't really think about wanting to be the editor of a, or, or, or the owner of a, of a newspaper. And those three men I've been thinking about are, are I, you know, my obvious one was going to be my father, um, the actual guy that set up the Southwark News, Dave Clark, and a guy that then sold me the Southwark News and was, you know, probably an inspiration to a lot of people locally in Bermondsey, as he's uh, Barry Alvin Dyer is the local funeral director. But he's no, he's no ordinary funeral director. This is a guy that became took over a small funeral directors, then became the European agent for cryogenics, you know, where you freeze the bodies and bring them back to life, even though he was a converted Catholic, so, you know, quite a staunch Catholic, but saw the need there. Created a numerous amount of shops, uh, but always held true to his Bermondsey roots. Never sold out to the, nation, to the multinationals, the co-op or those like, and won the contract to bring the... Um, Af Afghanistan, Iraq, you know, the truth back from Afghanistan and Iraq. So he was, you know, someone that's hugely interruptional. How I can put him and my father in the same category, I'm not too sure. My father was a guy that came over from Dublin at the age of 19 to England on a two-week holiday and never returned. He went, Jesus Christ, Kevin, this is swimming, swimming 60s, it was great. He had a great time. And I remember my nan, who, who only recently passed away, said, Jesus, he went, he, he got into the bus and I, I had the lads come back and uh, he, he, didn't, he didn't come back he, he, and he, he never returned. And he went over at 19, got the same job as a bus conductor and went there. But my dad I knew was a painter and decorator. And really, the reason I would put him in the same categories as that is because my dad was massively passionate about his job. He had to be a real perfectionist about it. And growing up in Bermondsey, there was actually a guy I just met here who works in the post rooms that we've not seen since we were on the council state together. But growing up in Bermondsey at that time, it wasn't the Bermondsey of today. I don't know if any of you have seen the Cradle to Grave uh, sitcom. That is the Bermondsey that I knew. That's, you know, I'm not that old. I was in the 80s. That was set in the 70s. I was only born in the 70s. But that's the Bermondsey I knew. But, I think I was really like, privileged, really fortunate to, to grow up in Bermondsey during that period with the parents I had because my parents were all about work. It was all a work ethic. And I remember saying to me, Mum, that I didn't think I'd end up you know, running a company or anything like that. I know I wanted to be a journalist. And she said, you did, Kev, because Jesus, I saw you when you were young. You said, come up to me and you said, I want the BMX bike. All the other lads in the estate are having the BMX bike. And they didn't have much money, Mum, Dad, so I said, but Mum, you have that catalogue. You've got the catalogue, you know, which some of the neighbours had bought stuff out and not paid for. But she had the catalogue, and I said, if, I, if it's one pound a week, or I can't remember how much it was exactly, 
I can get that, we can get the BMX bike, but how am I going to get the one pound a week? And my mum was doing early morning cleaning over in Allgate. So this when I was about 11. So every morning I'd get up and go to do early morning cleaning with my mum, get the money and come back. So it taught you from a very, and I don't think I'm unusual like that. I think lots of people like that. I think, but that was, that's what makes you like in that privileged position because you learn from a very early age that the only way in which you're going to get anywhere and the only way in which you're going to get something is by working for it. Dave Clark was someone that, you know, really did inspire me because he, he came to the area, was living in the area, set up this little news service, started the paper out because he saw there was a South London press and other stuff there, but the area was changing dramatically. This was in 1989 when he set it up. And he decided that he was going to create a, a Bermondsey News. It wasn't Southwark News then, it was the Bermondsey News. And he got this. This is what it looked like. Photocopy sheets of paper, 20p he charged. So he charged 20p and people picked it up. They identified with it being Bermondsey, wanting to go for Bermondsey. And people have loved it ever since. That's how the paper started. Dave Clark himself was someone that um, was an experienced journalist. Uh, he was caught by the Thatcher bug, just like my dad. He, he was a massive socialist and was with Dark as Howe on, on all the original things. And then that interview with Margaret Thatcher and completely converted. So the Dave Clark I knew was a massive Tory. <laughs> but he started this up and it, it worked in, he worked in many national news, uh, international news. He'd done newspapers, he'd done radio. And one of his biggest claims to frame was when he brought down a... Um, a Caribbean government, you know. So for, for me, as like a 20 year old, and always seeing that Dave was my hero. Dave was, you know, such a, a hard hack, someone I really wanted to be. And there was other people within Southern News that I really admired, and they've all gone off to do various things. You know, uh, Jeff Hill is now in charge of uh, ITV News. Uh, there's loads of people that are working uh, on IT, uh, ITV News, like. Damon Green that you see on the television and stuff, and people that went on to Sky Sports. So Dickie Davis, I knew from the early years that went on. And I thought I could really do something, I could really get there somewhere with that. But again, it's a ga again it was real passion and being grounded. And, and I remember one of, my, one of the first stories I did was with a woman. Uh, we got a call from, we got a call saying, someone's been stabbed in Woolworth, and this is where you're going to go, oh God, these terrible journalists. Someone's been stabbed in Woolworth, get down there, it's on the estate just off the East Street. And I went, okay, I'm going to go, I'm going to go. And I went down there. And you've got to do what's called death knock. You've got to go around and you've got to do it. You do feel a bit dreadful. You're knocked, knocking on all the doors. First door I knock on, Scottish woman comes out, she's livid. She says, I'm the mother of the boy that was stabbed. Because I knocked on the door and said, I'm, I'm just trying to find out about what happened with this, there's been a stabbing just here. And, and it was my other son that killed that son and all this. Oh, whoa, whoa. I was like, oh, my God. I've just started at the plate. I was thinking, oh. Uh, uh. And I was like, right, right, okay, can we, can we talk? And I was trying to think of ways to talk. She shouts up, because she must have been at her friend's, to the top of the balcony on the estate. And these four guys come down with face bats chatting. These, these effing, effing reporters after me. My bikers are just tied up uh, on the siding. She shouts up, can we get this reporter? So, and that's all her other sons. Knowing that one son had just killed the other son, these other guys come down with baseball bats and start running at me. So I'm down, I'm trying to get my bike out. I'm rushing off. I get through East Street. I'm going, going through East Street on my bike. You know, East Street Market, it's a really busy market. And I get onto the old Kent Road. At that time, this is 1997, so I didn't... I, I can't remember, did I have a pager? I, I, anyway, I didn't have a mobile phone. <laughs> so I get onto the... Onto the uh, telephone to the guys at, uh, at the office and Dave Clark answers and I said to him, Dave, I've just been there, the mother, come on, the son has killed the other son uh, and, and they chased me down the road with baseball bats and the rest of it. He said, but Kev, he went, Kevin, is there a shrine? Is there a shrine? And I said, well, yeah, uh, there is. And he goes, did you get a picture? And I went, well, no, because they've been chasing me down the road with baseball bats. I said, one brother's killed the other brother, and I've got the other four chasing me with baseball bats. He went, get back, it goes with the badge. He always had these sayings, it goes with the badge. It goes I was like, I can't, Dave. But I was so, 
I was so wanting to impress Dave that I went back and it was like a scene out of Betty Hill. Every time I came round, they came round, <laughs> we were running back and forth. <laughs> and eventually, eventually, I got, um, I, got the, I got the picture, but I went back and the other reporters there was like, Dave was wrong, I, you know. And to be fair, I don't think I put one of my journalists in that room, in, in, in that level of danger, but it was, just, it was just his passion that he showed you. So when we wrote the piece about the son killing the other son, we had to get the information from the, from the police. So the spelling was incorrect, the name of one of the son that had been killed. The, um, we'd put frenzied attack instead of uh, multiple stabbing instead of one stab wound. So Lucy, the mother, brings up going mental, um, rightly so. But I said to her, Look, listen, this is the reason, this is the reason we need to speak to you. And this is why I need to be talking to you. Me and Lucy are now like probably She's my best contact, and I would consider her a great friend. Lucy Cope, because I learned then that you do have these hard things, what journalists are quite well known as, but the more and more we did the work with Lucy, the more and more I felt like, as a local paper, you've got a responsibility. You're not going anywhere. You're not, not knocking on that door and walking away from the area. You're living in that area, and you're working with that family. And I did something that you don't normally do, which is, I used to read her back, just to read the story sometimes to her on the phone, because I felt that, and this is what I say to all my journalists now, when someone has had someone in their family who's been murdered, they've got to, you know, when someone's, been, when someone's died, it's hard enough, you don't feel like you have any control. When someone's been murdered in your family, you feel like all control's taken out of you, you have no sense of control. And if I can give that one little bit of control back by working with them, what goes into the paper, you know, working with them, you know, sometimes you might not like some of the stuff that's said, but we work with them. They're the victims. We're not going to be slagging the victims off as such. So, you know, we can do that. And we hold that true to today. It happened that Lucy was, found it really difficult because a lot of the national press took hold of it. Um, she was a woman with, her eldest son that got killed was white, her children, were mixed race. So even the voice at that time did think saying, was it was it a race thing? Of course it wasn't a race thing. But so but we me and Lucy worked really well over there. Lucy Cope then was someone that, you know, tragedy struck again a few years later, and this is when I was buying the paper from Barry Alban. I got a call and I'd been working all night to get the new look Southern news together. Lucy's son had been shot, another one of her sons, shot in a nightclub in the West End. I said to her, where are you? She was in tears. She said, I'm at the morgue. So she, one of the first people she rang was me at the morgue, when she was at the morgue. And this isn't just because of this woman's obsessed with being in the media. It's because she felt that we'd developed a rapport and we'd built up something. And you can, a newspaper can be something, a local paper can be something that makes, that benefits the local community. And I really try to instill that rest from my journalists. Because as a local paper, as a, you're a local business, and if you talk to any local business, it's all about their, their community, their customer basis, their customer focus. And that is something that I really got from Barry Albin, because Barry was someone that started, as I said before, a, a, a local paper, a, 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 took over the business uh, of his funeral directors. And met from a small funeral directors on Abbey Street, made it into this multi-million pound business it is today and got the contracts, and it's, you'll see him coming from Walton Bassett, going through, and doing all that. They come back, and I, and I wanted to get, I, I was proud, because I'd gone through the Dave Clark School, the goes with the badge care, balls in the back of the net, all these sort of things, and the, the guys were around us, and for three months, they kind of looked after us, bought the pa we bought the paper out fortnightly and continued it. In that time, that's where Barry Alvin came in. Barry Alvin came in and he said, I bought, because Dave was a great journalist, terrible businessman. Uh, so David, you know, Barry had helped Dave out and bought the paper. Barry was a local successful business funeral director and had a real passion for Bermondsey. And for the next three, four years, me and Chris Mullaney, that were the reporters there, run the Southwark News and did everything we could. And we are just as the editors, we were young. Uh, I started doing shifts then on London tonight and thinking, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to move on, I'm going to have to do my, my thing like everyone does. 
And Barry said, what about buying it? And I thought, oh God, if I could imagine buying a, like, a, like, buying a local paper, why, why not? But he didn't make it, you know, he made it really simple in certain respects, but he's like, you have to get the money together, you have to put a business plan together, you have to go to the bank. It was better than The Apprentice, it was. <laughs> uh, and we had to get an investor, and I found a guy that was doing printing to become as a, main, a minor shareholder. So we put it together, and we launched uh, in 2002, the Southwark News. And then, you know, we did other things around that. That's what I'm saying. With the weekend, I realised that Summit News was a more hardcore, true to its roots. Bits like you guys got here. We're Southwark, not Soho. You know, we, Bermondsey News is the old Bermondsey. It's the old Southwark. It's the, you know, but we live in an area that's changing. We're not Southwark, we're Soho. Well, there's a lot of those people in Soho that want to be here now because this is the area to be. And I thought, I've got a good paid for a title, but I need a defensive free. So what would I do? I'll get a defensive free. Most defensive frees are a watered down version of the paid for title. Try as I might, no matter how good I think the stuff the news is, it's good for its hard news, it's dry up, it's, it's crime, it's drama, all the rest of it. There's a whole new group of people that moved into the area that are um, here just for a few years. You know, they've got good jobs in the banks, they've got good jobs in the city. I need to be able to get out to them. I've got to get advertising, I've got to get out to them. So I thought I'd do a lifestyle, more of a lifestyle publication as my free. And that's what I've done with The Weekender. And now I'm on to the next route where I'm really working hard on is get my head around, which is the whole internet side of things. But, so The Weekender was very successful then. And, and, and we were able to get pitch for um, statutory notices in Lambeth. And then we were able to launch it in Lambeth too. But Barry had really given us one thing I hadn't really learned was just all the business sense and what to do and how to get, you know, how to get around on, on that. And, and when he died, obviously there was so many people came. It was, it was a whole week's funeral, imagine for this best funeral director, a whole week's funeral. But at the Queen sent a letter and everything. But I remember doing the review and saying, what, you know, to asking Barry what, before he died, what, you know, what was, what was the thing that you liked, that you, that you did the best? What was the you know, apart from your family, but within your career. And he said, creating the memorial garden in Bermondsey where local families could still come to remember their loved ones. And more importantly, in that memorial gardens, people that don't have, uh, there was a, that they don't have a burial place for their children that might have died of late miscarriages. They get put away in incinerators or in, in group graves. And he was the first person to create something like that in his memorial garden. And that's what he felt most passionate about. I'm not saying I'm hugely successful. If I go on and become a Murdoch and I run newspapers up and down the country, I don't know if I'd ever want to do it. I might want to be more like Barry, because how can you be part of your community when you're not involved in the community? And, you know, there's so many things we're proud of in the paper. I really love getting involved in the community. I love going down, being... You know, a woman rang me up last night, and this is another murder, but she, her daughter got murdered, and I'd done the story on her, um, out in Whitechapel. She was a heroin addict, but she'd never been able to find Bonnie's body. This is the mother. She rang me to say that she, uh, of a story last night about someone being stabbed on the estate. She will always be on my uh, contact there. Another woman, when I, was in, when I was, came into work yesterday, her son got killed. She came in, she's home, housebound, she sent her sister-in-law around. This is Tommy Blackmore, this is Blackmore's mum, with loads of Dunkin' Donuts. I want to thank everyone at the paper for what you've done. So, journalism can be a source of good, especially in a local, a local paper if it's done correctly. In some ways, the privileged position I'm in, in being the owner of an independent, I can decide how I want it run and how I, I do things. And it isn't all murder and mayhem, you know. There's three things that I really am proud of that we've done in the Southern News um, that are, we did blue, I don't know if you've seen them up, these blue plaques. So they are blue, there's various blue plaques up in London, but these, you might see the ones around here like outside the Globe that says, by London, by, voted by London Borough of Southwark. There's one at the Globe, there's one there. We got one, um, we started that up over 10 years ago because we felt this area was the most historic borough but it wasn't being recognised by the blue plaques. Because English heritage of the run of blue plaques said, the person needs to be dead, not too much of a problem, but the building needs to be standing. And the building couldn't be standing when you, you know, so much of it was bombed by the Luftwaffe in the, in the, during the Second World War. But, but worse than that, 
was the 1960s and 70s architects that destroyed swathes of places, especially around here. Swathes destroyed the whole place. So we said, what happened? I went to the council and said, you know, we can be good being a council. We don't always have to be enemies. We're going to have a go at you, but we're also going to be someone that, you know, if we can work together, could you partner up with us? Because we need planning permission. Go to the Southwark Heritage Association. Get people voting for Blue Plaques. We did it in our first Blue Plaques. 10,000 local people voted for it. So Sam Wanamaker got his blue plaque. One of my favourite blue plaques was for Phyllis Purcell, the inventor of the A to Z in Dulwich, because she's a woman that started out in the 30s and said, got in a black cab, said, take me here, here. the black taxi driver said, uh, yeah, I, I know where I'm going. I go, so how do you know? He goes, I've done the knowledge. She said, then after that, she went back to her dad, who's a map maker. She thought, we could, do, we could give everyone the knowledge. She went out. To publishing companies, asked them, would you present this thing? It's an aid set of, like, all, of London, of maps, the roads. They said, no, not interested, won't be interested, not, not a thing. She, in the 1930s, set up her own printing company and created the aid set. That's an inspiration. So that was something we did really well. We've done really well on apprentices. We did 100 apprentices in 100 days, you know, you know, working with businesses in the area. But, you know, the other thing we did that I'm really proud of was we got a school bill. It was back when I was the editor, um, and it wasn't me that got school, but it was a, a, a local woman called Kate Summers, was a grandmother, and it was at a time where they, had, they put in loads of primary schools, but they didn't think, the council, that we need to build secondary schools. So I found, I found one year, this was back in uh, about 1990, 2000, that you couldn't, there wasn't enough school places. So one of the grands got in touch with me and went, I've got them all down the tenants hall, Kev, come down. I said, yeah, get every single mum and kid there, and what I'll do is I'll do, I want to interview each one of them and I'll put it in the paper, each single one. We built up the support, we've got the City of London, we've got all the accounts, all the MPs behind us, we've got the City of London Corporation that needed school, a school for their kids but not, couldn't have a whole school to themselves so there weren't enough kids in the corporation, to sponsor one of the first city academies. Now that school is still built and it's down at St James's Road in Bermondsey. So, you know, I can say, I don't know whether I'd say, did I, inspiration, well the inspiration came from the people that helped me get to where I am today, but also from the people that we do stories on, you know. It is really a case of, I'm in that privileged position where I'm getting to see real life and real hardship sometimes and real good things and real heartwarming stuff and I'm not having to suffer the indignities that they do and that's probably why I love my job and why I'm inspired to continue doing it. I don't think I'll ever, I'll, it'll always be Kevin Quinn and the Summit News, it'll always be to say the same. That, that, that's all I can say. Thank you.